Hi everybody, my name is Travis Childs, I'm the archivist at the History Museum and welcome to Time Travels with Travis. Uh, today we're standing at the corner of Colfax and Taylor Street and this used to be the corner where Schuyler Colfax's home used to stand. Uh, it is not there anymore because it was torn down in the 20s and has been replaced by this building that you see behind me. Um, but Colfax's second home was on this location. When he first got married, they lived about a block or so away at 211 West LaSalle Street. They had a really small house. But when he became more predominant, became a politician, uh, uh, and was more uh, uh, wealthy, he was able to uh, buy a much larger home here. Uh, they said it was, it was a fairly modest home, you'll see it in some of the pictures that we have, um, and said that uh, Schuyler had a uh, library book collection that had 1,600 volumes in it. Um, but it wasn't a huge home like Clem Studebaker's typical new place, but it was a fine home uh, for him and it was his escape when he wasn't working in Washington. Um, Mr. Colfax, as you know, was not born here. He was actually born in New York uh, and then came out here after his uh, birth father died and his mom got remarried to a gentleman by the name of George Matthews. Mr. Matthews uh, took uh, Schuyler uh, who was fairly young. He was about, I think, about 10 or 12, somewhere around there. And they moved out to New Carlisle. Uh, his dad eventually became the postmaster uh, in New Carlisle for a while. Uh, and then eventually they moved into South Bend. Uh, Schuyler uh, went to school, uh, had some odd jobs as any young man would, but eventually he got really interested in politics, um, the law, uh, especially constitutional law, uh, and eventually uh, found himself uh, really liking to become an editor of a local newspaper. And there was a newspaper here in town called the South Bend Free Press. Uh, Mr. Colfax took that paper, saved up his money, and bought that uh, paper out and renamed it the St. Joseph Valley Register. Uh, it was a paper mainly uh, espousing the political ideologies of the Whig Party, which would eventually kind of morph into the Republican Party uh, when Abraham Lincoln became president. So it was kind of a political newspaper. Um, it was uh, kind of weekly for a while, um, a weekly circular for a while, had a lot of um, ups and downs with the paper, but eventually he got a really good circulation uh, here in the St. Joseph County area uh, and uh, was able to move on to bigger and brighter things. He was um, invited to become a kind of a columnist for the Indiana Journal uh, newspaper in Indianapolis or the Indianapolis Journal uh, in Indianapolis during the time that the Indiana state go government decided to revisit the original um, uh, constitution of the state of Indiana in 1850 and he was a kind of a delegate for that. He reported on changes. He was very much uh, a part of getting uh, uh, laws passed and laws taken out of the original constitution that did not allow African Americans to settle here in the state. Uh, he was very, very much uh, in the temperance movement as well as being uh, anti-slavery, very anti-slavery. And he made sure and tried his best to get the new constitution, the 1850 constitution of the state of Indiana, uh, uh, structured so that uh, slaves uh, who escaped from the South could stay here. Uh, it didn't work as good as he had hoped, unfortunately. But he would remember that and eventually uh, moved up in political circles. He uh, started um, exchanging letters with Horace Greeley, who was the New York Tribune uh, founder of the New York Tribune newspaper and uh, eventually became good friends and Mr. Greeley uh, helped him out a lot in his political career. Eventually Mr. Uh, Colfax found himself in the as a House of Representatives member uh, in 1855 uh, eventually moving up into the uh, 
speaker of the House position uh, in the uh, House uh, of Representatives and was there basically during a very, very important time in American history during the Civil War years. Um, Mr. Colfax and Mr. Lincoln. Uh, Mr. Lincoln wanted uh, Mr. Colfax on his cabinet, uh, but Lincoln, or uh, Mr. Colfax, sorry, Mr. Colfax uh, didn't want to do it, wanted to stay the Speaker of the House. Uh, he was able to uh, get through the House and get through Congress uh, the 13th Amendment, um, which uh, helped uh, uh, with slavery and the emancipation thereof. Um, and in the off times that he wasn't in Washington, he was here at his home. Um, eventually, uh, he did come back uh, after his time as Speaker of the House, and eventually, um, by Republican Party officials being pushed, eventually became uh, a candidate for the vice presidency under Ulysses S. Grant, uh, who became the president and started his uh, term in 1869. Um, Back then, uh, kind of like today almost, uh, vice presidents didn't do a whole lot. Uh, they were more, mostly figureheads and uh, went to parties and, and that sort of thing. But Mr. Colfax continued to work. He helped uh, try to get um, the Transcontinental Railroad uh, uh, completed uh, to connect the West Coast with the East Coast by rail line. Uh, and that's kind of where his downfall came in. Um, when Mr. Grant uh, was elected president, and Mr. Uh, Colfax was elected vice president uh, in 1869, they were the youngest uh, pair of president and vice president that was ever elected uh, until 1993 when Bill Clinton and uh, Al Gore uh, became president and vice president. Um, with the completion of the uh, Transcontinental Railroad, um, Mr. Colfax got himself embroiled in a kind of a scandal. Um, that has yet to really be proven what kind of part he had in that, uh, accepting monies um, from downgraded stocks of the rail lines that were uh, putting the Transcontinental Railroad in. Uh, and um, when the almost the end of uh, Grant's first term was up, uh, Colfax was kind of prodded again by the Republican Party to try to run for the presidency. Um, and that was unsuccessful. And by the time he realized he was not going to become president, he could not run for vice president because another vice president for Grant had already been elected. Um, plus, the scandal didn't help him much. And so he came back to South Bend. And when he came back to South Bend after his uh, time as vice president was up, uh, he never returned uh, to politics in any shape or form. Um, he had letters after letters and uh, contact after contact with government officials begging him to at least run for something, uh, and he wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, he spent his time, uh, his, his post-political career, uh, traveling all around the United States, uh, being a lecturer, uh, being kind of like a political advisor, uh, but he was mostly famous for his lecturing, uh, especially after Mr. Lincoln uh, was assassinated. Uh, Schuyler gave large speeches about uh, him uh, and Mr. Lincoln's uh, dealings together while Lincoln was in the White House um, and the uh, business that surrounded all of that in the Civil War and being Speaker of the House. And he was on one of these speaking tours um, and he was in Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, and in Mankato, uh, it was in January, of course, and so uh, the high for the day that he got off the train to switch a train to get on another train in Mankato, it was minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, he had had some problem with uh, vertigo, um, and evidently, uh, of course, later, they f he probably had health problems uh, with his heart. 
and he was trying to walk to the next station in Mankato in 30 degree, uh, minus 30 degree weather, uh, and evidently had a heart attack, a massive stroke, we don't know which, but died right there in a pile of snow. Uh, the uh, townspeople of Mankato didn't know who he was. Uh, when they finally found him, he was pretty well frozen. Uh, and they took him to a funeral parlor, uh, and once they were able to, if you want to say thaw him out, they were able to search his person, and they found out it was Skylar Colfax, the ex-vice president. Um, funny enough, Peter Studebaker, who lived just a block over here, um, was the one that came to Mr. Colfax's house and informed Mrs. Colfax of her husband's death. Uh, the funeral took place inside the house at this corner. Um, he was carried out uh, and he was buried two blocks, three blocks from here in South Bend City Cemetery at Colfax and Elm. Um, he was an interesting guy. Uh, there's a lot that has been written on him. A lot of it is, some of it is I don't want to say it's a lie, but it's not all that 100% true either. Uh, there hasn't been a really good, fair um, bi biography of Colfax done uh, here lately, um, but um, he had a very interesting life, uh, not only as a, as a newspaper man, but also as a politician and being in on some of the most important legislation that uh, our government had ever passed. And he lived uh, right here in South Bend at this corner uh, in a pretty modest house. Um, he, him and his second wife, uh, had a son and they named him Skylar Colfax. He became Skylar Colfax III and just like his dad, uh, he became mayor of South Bend uh, when he was uh, an adult. Uh, and so the political legacy carried on uh, from uh, the days that Mr. Colfax occupied the house here at Taylor and Colfax. And so that's the life of Skylar Colfax summed up uh, in just a few minutes. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you can come back uh, and uh, watch another time travel with Travis at a later time. And we enjoyed doing this for you.